The following presentation was recorded at the 2012 Southeast Linux Fest in Charlotte, North Carolina. It is licensed under a Creative Commons license. For more information about the Southeast Linux Fest, visit www.southeastlinuxfest.org. The Southeast Linux Fest would like to thank the following Diamond sponsors in 2012 for helping make these videos possible. Hello, everyone. Uh, so first of all, this is about MySQL cluster. Uh, there's been a change in the schedule, so anyone looking for, uh, I don't even know what I'm replacing, but anyone looking for something else, this is not the place. Uh, no one is leaving. All right, so I'm going to talk about MySQL cluster a bit. Uh, the details kind of about the, the architecture behind cluster. Uh, what go, basically what goes on, how cluster is, well, what's the basic architecture and, and also what goes on a bit behind the scenes because most of what happens inside a cluster is completely transparent to the end user. So you don't know what's going on uh, behind the scenes. And here I'll talk about what actually goes on behind the scenes. So you'll get a deeper insight into, into the architecture and, and, well, the title is when to use and when not to, uh, but it's kind of through understanding the architecture that you'll get that understanding. And we're a small group here, so feel free to, to ask questions at any point in time, and I'll try to answer. You got slides that are available? Uh, they are not available yet, but they will be, yes. If someone asks me for them. <laughs> I mean, if the organizers ask for them. I mean, I haven't sent them anywhere yet, so they should be available. All right, so let's start. First slide. I can't see anything here either. That's not a good sign. So first of all, um, has anyone here used cluster before, MySQL cluster before? No one? All right. That's, that's good. That's good. Uh, well, who uses My MySQL before? Who has used MySQL before? OK. So number one thing, MySQL cluster is completely different from MySQL. It's not the same product. So the name is, in a way, a bit misleading because it's not a cluster of MySQL servers. It's a different product. It, it's, uh, it uses MySQL as the front end, but it's implemented as a storage engine on the back end, uh, which means that, for example, if you're using InnoDB or something like that, you will have to migrate to use MySQL cluster. You can't just, it's not a cluster of normal MySQL servers. Uh, so MySQL cluster has a lot of nice features and a lot of nice promises. So for example, there's synchronous replication between nodes, ACID transactions, Row-level locking. So, ACID transaction and row-level locking are similar features to InnoDB, right? Who, who uses InnoDB? Who knows what InnoDB is? Okay. Good. So, it's a transactional cluster is transactional with row-level locking. Uh, however, cluster only supports one isolation level, read committed. So, no repeatable read or or, or anything else. So, it's only read committed. Uh, cluster has a shared nothing architecture, uh, which means that you don't need a SAN or anything like that. It runs on commodity hardware, right? So that's a good part. And it's automatic failover. So everything or most things in the cluster are automatic. They happen behind the scenes. You don't know, notice anything about replication, about nodes failing and st restarting. So for the end user, it's all transparent, which is good. Um, cluster has some more features. It's basically an in-memory storage uh, engine. Uh, in the beginning, it was only an in-memory storage engine. So, so everything you stored in the cluster was in-memory only. Now it's been extended so that you can store some of the data on the disk. Uh, uh, but it's kind of actually funny in a way because we started by storing everything in memory in cluster. And at the time, people didn't have a lot of memory. So people would come, well, I have like, 12 gigs of data, and how can I store that in my, 
in RAM, because at the time, four gigs of RAM was a lot. And so we decided, well, or they, my, the engineers decided to add disk uh, um, capability so you can store some columns on disk. But now when you can do it, no one wants to do it anymore because now RAM is abundant. But so even if you can store some of the stuff on disk, note that cluster was developed to be an in-memory uh, database, which means that basically it means that performance is much better for the in-memory part. If you store some of the data on disk, it has to be data that's not accessed all the time or has a less frequent access pattern than other data. But I mean, there are some ca you, very good use cases for this. For example, if you have blobs or something like that, which you access very uh, rarely, then you can store the blobs on disk and have the rest of the data in memory, for example. So there are use cases for it. Uh, cluster does have checkpointing to disk. So even though everything is stored in memory, there's still checkpoints written to disk so that the data is synchronized to disk in case of a complete cluster failure or in case of uh, when you shut down nodes and restart them so that they wouldn't have to restart from scratch. They have stuff on disk as well. Uh, cluster supports internally two types of indexes. There's uh, unique hash indexes and ordered uh, T tree indexes. Um, we'll get to that later, but basically you can have either unique hash indexes or ordered T tree indexes. And the cool thing with cluster is that there's a few online operations. Uh, for example, you can do software up upgrades without, without taking down the cluster. So uh, because you have, a, have a, a cluster with lots of nodes, you can upgrade one node at a time, and your cluster stays online the whole time. So for the end user, again, they don't actually see that you're upgrading stuff because it stays online all the time. And cluster actually has some, some additional features that no other storage engine has, has yet. So some of the altered table operations can be done online in the cluster. And with online, we mean that the table is accessible by other, other, other threads. So MySQL has the, has the annoying feature of, of all alter tables by default, means we, we start by locking the table. Second thing, we start by making a copy of the table. And then we copy all the old data to the new definition and stuff like that, which is very slow. Alter table in MySQL is really badly optimized. And because the table is locked during the operation, it can actually be pretty bad. But cluster supports some alter table operations online, such as adding columns, adding indexes, and stuff like that. So you can actually add an index to a cluster table in the background. So the index is being add, added, and while the index is being added, all your clients can still access the data. So that's pretty cool. And this is currently only in cluster. All right, let's look at the architecture. So uh, the cluster architecture differs quite heavily from a standard MySQL architecture because uh, the number one point is that there is a separation between the, the SQL layer and the storage layer. So what you see here is, is uh, well, you have your end users here, and they talk to, which could be you know, or Apache servers or whatever, talking to MySQL servers, and then separately there's a storage layer. So, you have your MySQL server somewhere, but they don't actually store any of the data, but the data is stored in this uh, uh, storage layer, which, is, which consists of data nodes. And these data nodes are separate processes. So you have each data node will be a process, most likely running on a separate machine. So you will have one machine per, per node, normally. You can also run multiple nodes on the same machine, but it's not recommended. <coughs> So that's the basic of the cluster. You have MySQL servers, and you have storage nodes or data nodes. And of course, the storage nodes or the data nodes is where all the synchronous replication and all that stuff takes place. The MySQL servers, well, in theory, you don't really need them. You actually have uh, direct access to the data node. There's, there's a C API, a native C API, so you can actually access the data nodes directly. And there are also other APIs. Uh, uh, Java API and, and so forth to access the data nodes directly. So you don't even have to use uh, MySQL servers. You can use you can use the data nodes as kind of no, uh, like a NoSQL solution as well. So you can actually combine. You can have some part that's kind of a NoSQL solution and some part you use the MySQL servers or something. Another cool thing with this uh, with this architecture is of course the flexibility. 
uh, you can have one cluster with four data nodes, and you can add MySQL servers to it if you need, right? So what do the MySQL servers do? Well, they parse the query, they optimize the query, and they process the data. So you can have two of these, you can have four of these, you can have 10, you can have 12. Basically, the number of MySQL servers has nothing to do with the number of data nodes. So you can change, variate here, yeah? So do the, da do the SQL nodes store any data? So no, they don't store any data. They have, they have metadata like the table structures and stuff like that, but it's updated from the data nodes. So if this guy changes, does an alter table, this guy will get the, the change from, from the data nodes. But basically all the data is stored here. Yes? So you can add like query So the query cache, you can actually have it. And uh, it used to not work because it used to not be invalidated. Now it's invalid. The problem, of course, is that when you start having many MySQL servers and many accesses, it will be invalidated so often so it doesn't make sense to use. But remember that this is stored in memory, right? So whether you need a query cache or not is, is also questionable. Uh, I mean, for the disk data, there is a, there is a buffer. Um, but they are stored on the data nodes, not on the MySQL servers. So if you actually store something on disk, there's actually a buffer for, or, you know, or a cache for the disk data as well. Uh, but it's stored local in the nodes. Uh, then there's something here called a management node, uh, which seems like it would be a fairly important node because it's called management node. But it's actually not. The management node is only used for, for well, it's kind of used for three things. Number one is, is configuration. So when you configure a cluster, the management node controls the configuration. So this is where you create, uh, you create the configuration file where you define the number of data nodes you want to have and stuff like that. And that's the management node uh, who owns that file. So when your no cluster starts up for the first time, or every time a node starts up, the first thing they do is they contact the management node and said, all right, I'm coming from this host. I'm node four or whatever. What is my configuration? And the management node will give its configuration. Or if it's a node that doesn't exist in the configuration, it will tell the node, sorry, you don't, we don't need you here. Shut down. And the node will shut down. So the management node controls the configuration. Apart from that, the management node uh, also uh, controls a log file. So the data nodes, they send events to the management node, and the management node then stores these events in a log file. Uh, but, but when you actually run queries and stuff, the management node is not needed for anything. So if the management node crashes, there's no effect whatsoever on the cluster. <coughs> but you can also have multiple management nodes as well. But, but it doesn't take part in any of the data access at all. Right, so this is the number one thing to remember the, the architecture of the cluster here. Uh, then I'll go into how the data, a bit of the internal handlings in the, in the data nodes here. So number one thing is that uh, in MySQL cluster, there's an automatic partitioning of the data. Uh, so depending on how many data nodes you have, every single table is partitioned into as many partitions as you have data nodes. So if you have two data nodes here, like we have here, every single table will be, will be partitioned into two buckets. Uh, and one node will own one of the partitions, and the other node will own the other partition, right? And this uh, uh, partition, uh, you can actually control how the data is partitioned, but by default, it's based on the primary key, and it's based on a hash value of the primary key. So the cluster uh, calculates a hash value on your primary key, and then does a simple mod on this hash value. And that's how it decides which node, or which partition each row will go into. And this is transparent and automatic. So you don't know, you don't know which, which uh, partition each row will go into. It's just done automatically. So that's a good question. So what happens when you have more nodes? So if you would have three nodes, well, first of all, uh, actually, I need to say one more thing before I can answer your question. So <laughs> hold on. 
All right, so the pro this is good, but, but there's one thing missing. And of course, if node 4 goes down, we lose the green partition, and we're dead because we lost half of the data. So there's, so there's actually also replication between, between uh, the nodes. So each partition will exist in one node, but it will also be replicated to an, a different node. So if you have two nodes, well, both nodes will contain the whole, all of the data. However, uh, one, of the, one of the copies of the partition is a primary replica and one is a secondary. And this is uh, important when you process queries because all query processing will go first to the primary version. So this is kind of only a backup. It's not really used. It's only part of, of write transactions and only as a safety net. Right. So now I can answer your question. So if you have three nodes, so first of all, you can actually define here, there's something called number of replicas, which defines how many copies of each partition do you keep. There is no default, but the recommended value is two, which means that every partition will exist in, on two different nodes. But you can actually change it. It can be one, which means this, which means you're not run using high, it's not high, highly available, so never use this. Uh, it can, in theory, be three or four, uh, but this will make your cluster extremely slow uh, because uh, we'll go into how the right queries take, take place, but it will add more latency. And another thing is that three or four are not very tested because no one actually uses them. So most people will just run with two copies of everything, and that's it. But theoretically, you can use three or four. Yes. So if you have a transaction, when you're running a write transaction, uh, we will actually go through exactly how it's done. But basically, it will ensure that when you get a commit, it's been committed on both nodes. Unless, of course, one node went down during the process or something like that. But, but as long as all nodes are there, it will be committed on both places. Uh, but so this number of replicas, so if it's set to two, this means that you can only have a combination of uh, a multiple of two data nodes. You cannot have three. You can have two or four or six or eight, but you can never have three no data nodes because it wouldn't work. If you have four data nodes, well, basically, the table is partitioned into four tables. Each data node will get one, one partition as, as its primary, and then there, uh, there will be a backup on a different node. And the nodes will actually work in pairs, which means that node five and six will replicate each other. And this is a design choice which has, it could be done differently, but this is the way it's done. And this has implications for, for, uh, for uh, 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 performance. For example, if a node goes down, let's say node five goes down, this means that node six, the, the, yellow, fr the yellow partition here, will, will become the primary where it was the secondary previously, which means that node six will have twice the traffic it had before. Because everything going to the blue partition and everything going to the yellow will go only to node six. It won't be exactly twice, because the, the reads won't go twice, but all the writes, uh, I mean, sorry, the, because the writes won't, will, was all, were already here, but all the reads, if you have more reads than writes, it will now have twice the amount of reads on this node. Which means that when you, uh, kind of configure your cluster, you have to be able to, uh, each machine or each node has to be able to withstand twice the amount of traffic you have it in normal, uh, under normal circumstances. So if you see that you're running your machine, your nodes on like above 50% of utilization, it means that if you have a crash, you won't be able to handle your load because one of your servers will be overloaded. So the group is, depends on this number of replicas uh, variable. So it's configurable, but by default, it's always two, yes. So if I, what? You can, but then you have to have three in each group. But it's not recommended, but you can. Theoretically, you can. So 
so the number of replicas is kind of the minimum amount of nodes you have to have. <clears throat> so if you set number of replicas to two, you have to have at least two nodes. And then you can have two, four, six. And each time you add nodes, you add a group of nodes. No, you need to add as many nodes as there are nodes per group. So like here, I have, run, I have four nodes now. I could add two more nodes to have six. You can't, you can't do that. You can't add nodes to existing groups. You can only add groups. So what happens when you add groups uh, is that if I add a new group here, Let's say I'm, running, I'm using this and I'm starting to run out of disk or uh, sorry, out, of, out of memory on my machines. So I want to add another node group. So I add two more machines, and then the tables will be partitioned into six partitions instead of eight. And well, these new partitions will come here. By default, when you actually do the process of adding nodes, uh, the old tables won't be re reorganized until you, you have to do a command to do it. But every new table will automatically be in, in, in six. So when you, if you add nodes to a running cluster, the new nodes will be empty at first. And you have to table by table do this alter table reorganize partition. It's an online operation. So it's done in the background. Yeah, so, yeah, that would mean that your data, is some, your access is somehow skewed to just some rows and stuff. So you, if you see that there's a lot of access to these nodes, it means that they're accessing only certain rows, right? So one thing you could try doing is just changing the, the partitioning key. Instead of partitioning on the whole primary key, partition on something else. But you, you can also add another node group because then because then the, uh, the data will be repartitioned. So then that, that would potentially split up the rows that are accessed uh, a lot. All right, any other questions about this, how the data is split up? So, and the, and so this is all automatic. You don't even see it. If you do a create table uh, with engine cluster in MySQL, this will be done automatically. You don't have to worry about it unless you have some problems. And when you insert rows, update rows, you don't see any of this. It's automatic. Right. Um, so some of the features in the cluster. So uh, when you, in general, when you have an HA uh, solution based on a shared nothing architecture, one of the main problems is, is the so-called split brain scenario, right? And the split brain scenario uh, has to do with the fact that um, when, a pro when, you, when you have a shared nothing architecture, uh, everything depends on communication over the network, right? Nodes communicating. And the problem arises when a node does not answer. So a node is not answering communication. You have no way of knowing, is this node actually down or is it just a communication problem somewhere? So, any type of HA solution share nothing. You have to f have some kind of mechanism for dealing with this. What do we do when a node is not responding? So you will find that in, in different scenarios, they use different things. Uh, uh, and Cluster has this thing called network partitioning protocol, which is there to kind of take care of, of, of this scenario. So as soon as there's a communication problem, one node is not communicating to others, or many nodes are not communicating, basically any kind of communication problem in a cluster, the data nodes launch this network partitioning protocol, which is designed to, to basically avoid split brain. Uh, so basically, they have a few questions they ask themselves or the nodes, and, and that then determines whether the nodes can continue or will, whether they will actually commit suicide. Uh, so the first thing the nodes do if they, if they uh, have a communication problem is they regroup. So the nodes that can communicate, they regroup and say, all right, we can communicate. Let's do the network partitioning protocol. So the first thing they do is, all right, do we have at least one node group from each, uh, at least one node from each node group? So do we have at least one from each of these groups? Right. If the answer is yes, 
then we're good to go to the next phase. If the answer is no, let's say node 6 somehow it gets cut off from the network. So node 6 will launch the same protocol. It will say, all right, do I have one node from each node group? No, it's alone. It will actually commit suicide. So this means that you don't need an external process for shutting down stuff when there's split brain scenarios because they will actually commit suicide. So this guy will kill itself, say, okay, I can't continue. Uh, then if they pass this, the second question they ask is, okay, are all nodes present from any of the node groups? And if the answer is yes, then the nodes know that no other network partition can pass phase one which means that they know that they, are the, they can continue as the only uh, viable cluster. So I mean, the kind of the problem here is that we would potentially have two partitions of the clusters, both saying that they are the cluster, which means that you would write some writes here, some writes there, and it's no longer synced, and it's kind of game over. So that's why we have to make sure that only one stays up. So that's the second question. If they can't answer yes to this question. This means that we have an even split. So for example, if you have two nodes, uh, so this scenario here, if one of the nodes crashes or there's a communication problem, you always have an even split, right? You always have one node and one node. So the first qu two questions won't help either of these because they cannot determine they neither will have uh, all the nodes from a node group, and both of them will have, well, one node from each node group. And this is where phase three comes in. We ask the arbitrator. So we need a third external process that determines who can live and who can die. And this external process could be the management server. It could be any of the MySQL servers. The only rule is that the arbitrator uh, is decided, is decided early, and during the network partitioning protocol, the arbitrator cannot be changed. So they are stuck with the arbitrator they had before they had a communication problem, which means that both will ask the same. And the arbitrator has a simple, actually, rule. The first ones who ask will get a yes, the second ones will get a no. And this basically process ensures that we will never have a split brain scenario in the cluster. You guys follow? No one understood the thing? No? You understood it? Okay, cool. So, I mean, I mean, this is built in the cluster. Again, you don't have to worry about it. It's automatic, but it's just something you need to be aware of. You will see in the logs sometimes when you're in the cluster. So, n network partitioning protocol launch, blah, 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 asked arbitrator, arbitration won, and stuff like that. And again, if you have just two data nodes, which is like the minimal, configuration, you will have this every time there's a problem, it will go to the arbitrator and they will ask the arbitrator every time. What's the implication for the application of this? You know, because in a sense, some part of your data is not going to be available if you if the arbitrator decides to continue operating, but no, all of your all of your data will be available. That's the whole point. That, I mean, that's the whole point. So I mean, uh, I mean that's why we we have replication between. Them. That's why we have these node groups, right? So, if we have an uneven split like this, node six goes out. Node six will commit suicide, but the other three will continue, and you still have all of your data, because node five, node five has the blue partition that node six was the owner of. So you have all of your data, and your cluster will continue. And I mean, if you have an even split, it's, it's the same thing. It's just that this time it's the arbitrator who has to decide. But the data is still there. So I mean, if you would have a network partitioning where half of your nodes can't communicate with the other half, uh, some, they will have to ask the arbitrator, and the arbitrator will actually say no to, to one of these partitions, and those nodes will commit suicide and stop, stay there. And then, then, you have to, then they have to be restarted, and then they will rejoin the cluster, and it's a new process. But, but for a time being, they're down because they can't communicate. But it has no implication in that sense for your applications at all because this is all behind the scenes. I mean, the, the protocol itself, I mean, running the protocol will take a few milliseconds. Uh, so during that time, they cannot process any transactions. So there will be a small few milliseconds 
slight glitch delay in the transaction processing because, but I mean, it's already there is a problem. Something either crashed or there's a communication problem. So, so it's, I mean, it's better to have it resolved properly than to continue and get some weird results afterwards. Right. So how do we detect that a node is not communicating? Well, first of all, in every single transaction, of course, nodes are involved. So during a transaction, if a node is not responding when it should be, the node that notices this will raise a flag. Uh, but there's also a heartbeat circle between nodes. So the nodes send, send each other heartbeats. And as soon as one node hasn't sent these heartbeats for three, three consecutive times, the receiving node will raise a flag again and say, OK, node six is not sending its heartbeats. Let's exclude it. And this is when they start the network partition protocol. They basically, the first thing they do is they exclude the node from, from, the, from the heartbeat circle. Then they do the network partitioning and see if they can continue or not. And so basically, the heartbeat uh, circle is kind of this, the la last line of defense. If for some reason, during transaction processing, you don't notice that the node is actually down, its connection is just hanging or something weird, uh, then the heartbeat is kind of the last line of defense. So the longest time it takes to detect a node failure is three heartbeats. By default, the heartbeat is, I think, two seconds. So six seconds is kind of the longest it can take to detect a failure node, fail node. And this, again, can be tuned up or down, depending on your systems. But you can detect a node failure earlier as well. Right. So let's look at how transactions are actually processed within the nodes. Uh, so what happens is that your client, whatever it, it, it is, sends a, a, a request, transaction request, to a MySQL server. And the MySQL server will then talk to the data nodes. So the MySQL server, or the SQL node here, sends a transaction request out. And one of your data nodes will become the transaction coordinator for this transaction. So every single transaction always has a transaction coordina coordinator. But the transaction coordinator here is actually one of the nodes. So every node has the capacity of, of becoming a transaction coordinator. And well, they will be. And how this is selected, how this transaction coordinator is selected depends. There's a few ways. There's a few ways the MySQL server can select the transaction coordinator, but the kind of the easiest to understand is the round, round robin. So there's a few options, depending on whether the MySQL server and, and data node processes live on the same machine or, or not and stuff. But let's say that the default, the, I mean, the easiest is just round robin. It is just one of the nodes, right? You don't control it. You can control it. If you have simple queries, you can try to control it to optimize stuff, but, but you don't have to worry about it. So one of the nodes becomes a transaction coordinator. <coughs> right. So this is a write transaction, because a read, of course, is simple. So the first thing to do is that the transaction coordinator looks at your query. Which row are you going to write to? And of course, the transaction coordinator, it knows the hash function. So it knows in which partition this row lives. So it will send the request onwards to the node who is the primary, has the primary replica of this partition. So let's say we did an update on a row. That row exists in the green partition. We send it to node 3 because node 3 has the primary replica of the green partition, right? Everyone is OK so far? Yes? What if my access is not If you're? Oh, if you're right, you mean you're writing based on something else? Uh, I'll, get, I'll get to that, but I'll get to that. I'll get to that. It's, it makes it a bit more complicated, but basically the end result will be the same. It will just make it a more complicated transaction. That's all. Right, so this is a transaction where we, where we base it on the primary key. All right, so the transaction goes to the primary, uh, to the node with the primary replica. And this is where the locks are now taken. So the, the primary replica will actually lock this row now. Because we're doing a write, so the no row needs to be locked. So this is where it's locked. Once the operation is done here, it goes, it goes to the secondary. Same thing. Rows are locked. Operation is performed. Then when the secondary is done, it goes back to the transaction coordinator, saying, all right, 
we've basically completed the operation. But this is called a prepare phase because it's actually not validated yet. It's not committed yet. And the idea here is uh, in order to commit a transaction, we have to make sure it actually passes in both the primary and the secondary. Right. So once, it, once it's passed, then we can commit the transaction. So we go back the other way around, say, OK, validate the transaction. And it validates, sends to the, the primary, validates. And this is where the locks are released as well. That's why we go the other way around. So the locks are not released until, until uh, the transaction has been validated also on the, on the secondary. Hmm? Why could it not pass validation? What? Why could it not pass validation? Uh, it could. It's just that we want to, basically, the, the point here is to make the prepare phase go a whole full circle before we validate. That's basically the, the point here with the two-phase commit. I mean, it's a two-phase commit protocol. I mean, that's why. But, but the point is to make sure that all of the replicas pass the, valid, the prepare phase. And that's kind of why we do it in two phases. Yeah, XA uses some kind of uh, version of two-phase commit. Yeah. I mean, yeah. So we have the prepare phase and then the commit phase. And uh, once it's once it's committed on the on the on the primary, it goes back to the transaction coordinator, and then the transaction coordinator says, "Okay, transaction was successful," to to your SQL node. So there's a few things here to notice here. One is there's a lot of messages. This is one primary key write. And every single one of these arrows are potentially network hops. And they're sequential, which means that the latency can be somewhat worse than, than doing this in local memory on a machine, right? So that is the number one performance, potential performance issue with cluster is latency, right? Because you have to do all these steps in sequence. And this is also where, so I mean, basically each each arrow here is as long as it takes for you to communicate between the machines. So you can easily, easily look at the network latency between the machines and take that times six, and you'll get what the time it will take to perform each operation, plus, of course, what it does internally. But, but that's fairly fast compared to, compared to network latency. This also means that if you move, you have one node in the US and you put the other one in China, it's going to be very slow, because it's going to be six times the communication between the US and China. <clears throat> and this is for a simple operation. So basically, this means that you don't want to have your, you normally don't want to have a geographical distance between your nodes. You want them to be close by, network wise, close by because of this. Uh, and that's one thing to notice. And then I guess the second thing, the second thing here is that um, in case of a failure during a transaction, what happens? And the answer, it, it depends on which, fa which stage a transaction is in. So basically, as long as the prepare phase, phase has been completed, your transaction will actually be completed. Uh, the cluster nodes have protocols for taking over half-done transactions and stuff like that. So once the network partition protocol is done, then they will look at, OK, which transactions are half-done and which were through the validated and stuff like that. So basically, all, validated, all transactions that have done the prepare circle will actually be validated. Transactions that are not done somewhere here where there's a, where there's a failure will actually be aborted. You will get a, uh, the cl client will get a, uh, an error instead. Any questions about this? Right, so that's a two-phase commit. Um, So, so I already talked about this. There's two types of indexes. I'm running out of time here, so I'm going to do this quickly. Uh, the big thing to notice here is that uh, uh, because the cluster is, because the data is distributed, uh, having a global index is actually not that easy because, well, how do you update, how do you maintain it and stuff like that. So that's why if you want to use an ordered index, so. Order, of course, meaning that there's structure. There's an, uh, you can do it, use it to do range queries and stuff like that. What the cluster uh, does is that it creates a local index. So each node will have a, will have an, uh, a tree index, which is only uh, covering the rows that exist on this node. Right. 
This means that if you use if you use this index to search for rows, you will have to launch this search on every single node because you don't know which node will actually have the rows and which won't. So that's the the drawback. But uh, the good part is it's quite easy to maintain and it doesn't cost a lot. Then there are unique hash indexes as well, and they are implemented in the cluster as hidden tables. So it's fairly complex uh, uh, way of doing it. Basically. Uh, if you create a unique hash index on a column, uh, the cluster will create a hidden table where the indexed column is the primary key and the primary key of the original table uh, becomes the columns in that table. And then it will, it will do this transparently, you won't see this, but when you do a lookup using the unique hash index, it will first do one lookup in the unique hash index hidden table to find the primary key values of the original table and then do a second lookup to find the actual rows. You will see how this works. Uh, so basically, internally, the cluster supports four uh, native operations. When I say internal, this is basically the engine, the storage engine supports four operations. And the MySQL server has to transform anything you say in SQL. The MySQL server has to transform into these four operations. Right. So if you do, you do I write a nine table join with where clauses and whatnot, the MySQL server has to boil them down to these operations and then combine them somehow, somehow. So the first operation is, of course, primary key operations, so reads and, and writes. The second is unique index operations, ordered index scans, and full table scans. And that's all. That's the only thing the cluster supports internally. So everything else is a combination of this. So I'm going to show now basically how these operations happen inside the cluster. So first, if you do a primary key write, we already saw this. Uh, but here, I only have the node, so I, I don't actually have a, the logical separation here. So if you do a primary key write, we contact the transaction coordinator. The transaction coordinator then goes to, so these, all these things are blocks, inside, are modules inside the data node. So each data node consists of a lot of modules. And they kind of run independently. Uh, inside a data node, and there's a messaging service between these, these modules, right? Uh, right, so the, Mac, the MySQL server contacts the transaction coordinator module, uh, and you will see that when you run, when you run multi-threaded uh, uh, cluster, so you run, there's a multi-threaded version of the, of the cluster, uh, what you, what you uh, run more of is these modules. So in a multi-threaded data node, you will have more transaction coordinators per node or more local query handlers per node. Right, so you contact a transaction coordinator, then the transaction coordinator contacts the local query handler of the node where the, where the row resides, who then goes to the ACC block and the two block to, ACC block is where the primary key values are and the two block is where the actual rows are. So it's just two blocks uh, handling data. Once that's done, we go to the secondary, do the same thing. We go back to the transaction coordinator, say, all right, prepare phase is done. And then we do the circle backwards and validate the stuff, right? The same thing we just saw a moment ago. Except that here we have also the internal messages being done between the blocks. And that's a primary key write. If you do a primary key read, it's a lot simpler <coughs> because we go to the transaction coordinator, we go to the local query handler where the row is, and that's it. We find the row through the ACC module that has the primary key. We go to the uh, TUP module, tube for tuple actually, where all the rows are, and then we're done. This data node will actually send the answer to the MySQL server directly. So we don't have to go back, we don't have to go to the secondary, we don't have to go back to the transaction coordinator, we just send the results straight to the MySQL server. Right? That's a primary key read. So a primary key read is fairly optimized in MySQL cluster. And that's actually, normally if you look at performance benchmarks where MySQL cluster looks really good, it's mostly primary key reads. That's what it's optimized for. The cluster is really fast at primary key reads. Uh, and in particular, when you run multiple data nodes, the, the whole point is with the primary key reads is that you only need, need to access the data node with that 
uh, row when you do primary key read. Which means if you have eight nodes, you can actually run eight primary key reads at the same time. I mean, exactly at the same time. Because each node, you only need to access the node with the row, which is the cool feature with, with, with the primary key reads. If you do a unique index read, um, it's basically the same thing as doing two primary key reads, as I said before, because a unique index is implemented as a hidden table. So uh, it's the same as doing primary key reads. If you want to do a, a writes, um, you can actually do unique index writes. If we just use the unique index, uh, if we basically do the same thing, if we first do a read and then write the values through the unique index. So it's similar to a primary key write. So again, it, from a SQL perspective, it looks the same. You write, you say, you have a unique index on a column, and you do a lookup where you said where a where clause on that column, okay. and the MySQL server will then transform this into a unique index operation on the cluster level. Does that have, so that's it has to be an equality. Yes, that's why it's called unique. I mean, that's why it's, it's only unique. Uh, but it won't do a range. No, if you use a range scan, unique index is useless because it's a hash index. So then you will have to have ordered indexes, or then otherwise it's full table scans. So I mean, the unique hash index is a bit peculiar for the cluster, but, but yeah. It's not, it has to be unique, first of all. So you can't even have a collisions to create a unique hash index. So it's not that often that you, uh, you can actually create one. So in most of your indexes, in, you will have the primary key, and then you will have ordered indexes on the rest of the columns most of the time. Uh, so if you have an ordered index read, what happens? Well, the transaction coordinator will have to contact all of the data nodes. Here there's only two, but if you have eight, it will contact all of the eight nodes, and each node will then use the local index to find the rows that match on this node and send them over. So the cool thing with this is that it's actually done in parallel as opposed to sequence. So you don't have to wait for node one to send the results, and then you go to node two. But So the contact, transaction coordinator contacts all of the nodes, and they independently work. So I guess similar to, I don't know, MapReduce, well, anything that's distributed, basically. So they independently do their lookup and send the results. And then the MySQL server here gets the results and then makes sure that there's in, in a buffer and basically waits until all the nodes have answers and the answered, and then it creates the result. Can you do, uh, yes, but they're done by the MySQL server. But my aggregations are always done by the MySQL server. So cluster doesn't, cluster doesn't have any internal aggregation functions. But, but this will still be fast because you're using the index to access the rows, right? Well, if you do a full table scan, it's actually the same thing, except that you don't have an index to find rows. You just send everything, right? Uh, what's not said here is that uh, MySQL has something called a, a push down condition. So basically, if you have where you do a full table scan with a where clause, the where clause is actually pushed to the data node. So they actually filter the rows already here. So they don't send everything to the MySQL server. And this, I'm pointing this out because this was not always the case. In the first version of Cluster, uh, this didn't exist. I mean, Cluster had the functionality, but it wasn't used. So if you did a full if you do a full table scan with a where clause, every single node sent everything they've got, which could take a really long time because it's over the network. And then the MySQL server had to do the filtering, which made all full table scan queries really, really slow because you had to send everything over the network. But because now you can, now you actually, this is on by default, now you actually filter them on the node, so you don't have to send everything on the network, which is good. And that's basically it. These four operations is only thing clusters support, supports internally, and everything else is a combination. Right. Uh, so some optimizations you can do is first of all condition pushdown I just mentioned, because you have to then you don't have to send everything you send less data and this is done automatically. Uh, batching. Uh, why? Well, because everything is done in sequence, so latency uh, is a problem. So if you have 100 queries, let's say 
1,000 queries per second. Okay, maybe that's too much, but 200 queries per second. If you send each uh, uh, operation, each, each um, request individually, each individual will have a sequence, and they will be done in sequence, and it will take time because there's network hops in between. What you can do is you can batch the queries, send a bunch of, of transactions as one to the transaction coordinator and stuff. And MySQL actually has, does this automatically. So it batches queries, has a small window. It waits, for, waits for, for this window, and then it batches all the queries at the same time. So the individual query might actually be a bit slower because it had to wait the, the few microseconds before the, the batch window was full. However, the overall throughput of the cluster increases because you can do more of these at the same time. So the cluster is all about throughput. Throughput will be great, but in some cases, individual queries might be slow because of the latency between the network hubs. But the throughput will be great. Right. But batching in m most cases will make cluster better, work better, the throughput better. Uh, so one of the problems with cluster previously until the latest version was complex queries. So for example, a simple join. So here we have a join of two table. Uh, we're joining them on something which is a primary key in the second table, and it is, and we have a where clause on a column in the first table, right? Which could be the primary key or something. Or it could be a where clause where it's a range, whatever it is. So the problem here is that the way MySQL used to use joins is MySQL had one way of doing joins and one way only. And that's nested loop joins, which is basically four loops, nested four loops. Each table will have its own for loop. And then we, so we start by looking at one, we get one row from the last table. Then we go start looking all combination of rows for this table. Then we move up to the back one step and we get all combination, blah, blah, blah. So the problem with this for, for cluster is because it's done in, in sequence, every time there's a network hop in between. So you can imagine if you have 10 tables with millions of rows, you do a join. I mean, the operation might be fast, but you add network latency between each operation, which means you know, a, few, a few hundred thousand times milliseconds means a lot of seconds. So joins could be really, really slow in the cluster. And that was kind of a fundamental flaw with the cluster for until, the, until this release 7.2. So basically, a join, every type of join would be cut into these steps, and you would be latency between them. Uh, 7.2, so the latest GA release of cluster, added basically uh, one main major improvement, which is that operations can be linked on the data nodes. So this means that these four operations we saw, the native operations, they're still the same. However, what you can do is that you can uh, combine operations so that you say that, all right, I want to do this operation, and based on the result on this operation, I then want to do, do this operation. So previously, you, you can only do one operation at a time, or you could batch them, but the results could not be linked, which means that, for example, if I do a join where I look up one row in one table, and then based on the row I find in this table, I will look up another row in another table, I had to you know, get the results process them in the SQL node, and then send them back. Now I can actually do this on, on the data node. So I say that, OK, these two will be linked. Get this result, and then do this operation. And that has, uh, in many cases, improved the joint performance quite a bit for cluster. So that's a cool thing. Uh, there are some limitations to the current implementation. For example, uh, as long, if you only use primary key operations, this will work. And you can combine the primary key operation with one uh, uh, ordered or full table scan. If you have more than one ordered index or full table scans, then you cannot use this linking anymore, and it won't be fast. But I've seen join improvements of actually over 100. I saw one join that was over 100 times faster in the same point. Yeah. No, it doesn't assume anything. Yeah, so. It's kind of server Well, it will still gain because you don't have to send the results back to the MySQL server. So, I mean, that's kind of the problem previously. You had to send every single middle step had to be sent to the MySQL server. So now uh, it will be communication between the data node. The, the transaction coordinator will, will, will coordinate this instead of the 
uh, MySQL server. So it's less network hops. And of course, for all the rows that are on the same node, it's even faster because it's a local messages. So it will make it faster in all cases and really fast in many, but not all. Uh, and you can actually improve. The, in theory, you can actually uh, help this because, as I said, the partitioning is by default the primary key, but you can change the uh, partitioning uh, uh, for some tables. For example, uh, if you have a table with a primary key, you have another table with a composite primary key where one of the columns is the primary key of the first table. You can actually change the partitioning of the second table to be only of that set, same column. So that, uh, for example, uh, let's find something quickly. Let's say you have a social network, you have accounts, and you have accounts, the friends of each account, right, in a secondary table. Uh, so you can have the secondary table to be, uh, to be partitioned only on the, on the account part, not on the friend, not on the whole combination of account and friend, which means that my max account in the secondary table, all the rows containing my friends will be on the same partition as my account. So I can get uh, my account and the list of my friends on one partition. Then if I want to go more details about my friends, then I have to go elsewhere. But basically, I'll get the basics from just one partition, which I means stuff like that you can do to make it even faster. Right. So let's look at a simple query. Uh, so the same query we just saw. And we can see with explain. Do you guys know explain? Good. So with explain, you actually see stuff here. Does anyone see this? So in the extra column, you see stuff. And I've actually magnified it. So I removed all the other columns. Right? We only have the extra columns. So the other columns would just so show normal, normal uh, uh, explain stuff. But in the extra column, you actually see uh, this stuff that has to do with the cluster uh, join linkage. So here I had two different, two, different, uh, two different queries. One is doing a primary key, primary key lookup, so very efficient. And the other one is doing a, a, an ordered index scan combined with a primary key lookup. And both of these can, can, uh, can use this, this new feature of 7.2. So you get this stuff in the extra column. So far, so good? So basically, if you haven't used cluster before, start with 7.2. Don't go and use the versions that don't have this feature. All right, is there anything else? Well, so if you use the multi-threaded version, so the, the cluster comes in two, or the data nodes come in two versions. There's one that's single-threaded and one that's multi-threaded. If you use the multi-threaded version, actually everything you saw up to now is wrong. So, well, actually, not, not exactly. but. Uh, if you use the multi-threaded version, basically the notion of data node becomes a bit fluid because uh, uh, in the multi-threaded version you will have, if what it launches is that it launches several transaction coordinators per node process, several local query handlers per node process, and so forth. Uh, however, the tables are partitioned based on the amount of local query handlers, not the amount of data nodes. Right, so it will just change how many partitions you have and stuff like that. So if you're using the multi-threaded version of MySQL cluster, you will actually get a lot more partitions than what you have data nodes. And in 7.2, the latest, well, this is not the latest anymore, but basically you can have up to 36 threads per data node. And you can actually specify how you want these uh, threads to be divided amongst the different blocks. So you can say, OK, I want 10 transaction coordinators per node and 20 local query handlers, for example, or something like that. So you can really fine tune how you want this multi-threaded thing to work. <coughs> right, so it makes it even more complex. But again, all of this is transparent. You don't, I mean, you don't see any of this. Uh, it just helps in understanding what goes on and why cluster is slow in some cases and why it's not in others. All right, so to, to summarize, where does MySQL fit, uh, cluster fit? Well, high demands of availability. So this is still by far the solution with the highest availability out there. So if you need really high availability, cluster is the only one uh, that provides five nines. 
it's also the only one who actually scales writes because of the dist distribution of the data. It automatically scales writes. Primary key operation writes will always be just to, to, to the node where the data is. So it actually has true write scalability. All the others don't. Uh, and the problem is if you have a fully normalized, normalized schema with lots of data, well, then you will run up into these issues with latency because you have to join lots of tables and stuff like that. So that's when it perhaps does not work so well. Of course, the data should also more or less fit into memory. So if you're having terabytes of data, MySQL cluster is probably not the right solution for you. But memory these days is not a big problem, so you can have several hundred gigs of data and it will still fit. So one, one big th thing also when it doesn't fit is the network, because everything is done on the network, so you have to control, be able to control the network. You want to have a dedicated network, first of all, for cluster internal communication. You don't want to have uh, random HTTP access stuff going on the same network. You want to have a dedicated network just for the cluster internal communication. And this is also why the cluster does not fit into the cloud so well, because you don't really control the network in the cloud. And at the moment, you don't, it does not support foreign keys. It supports blobs, but not very efficiently. So you have to, if you want to use blobs and the cluster, you can do it, but beware that it will be slow. And it basically, you should store them on disk and not in memory if you do. And that's about it. If you have any questions, I'll be here, of course, now, and I'll be at the booth. But otherwise, you can just send me an email or something. Any questions right now? Yes. When is getting cheap? So just for tips, single node within a DB versus single node cluster. Is there a form of difference? Yeah. The, I mean, the cluster will, in most cases, be slower, but not significantly slower. But it will be slower, yeah. I mean, where the cluster will win, and, and it will by far beat, beat in a DB, is when you start having more than two nodes. And again, when you do simple operations, like you do, because the throughput. Well, so but the, the, the thing with cluster is that you can have multiple MySQL servers. So, and that's where exactly InnoDB will run into problems. InnoDB won't be able to utilize, I mean, the, the, the fact that you can parallel, completely do stuff in parallel on the cluster. I mean, they did benchmarks recently where they got up to, uh, what did they say? One billion queries per minute, which is basically whatever it is, 27, I mean, something 20 million queries per second. I mean, it's reads and stuff, but still 20 million per second. It's pretty impressive. Even writes, they were at, writes, they were at 2 million writes per second. So two, I mean, primary key operation, but still, two million writes per second. That's pretty impressive. And it's with one, just one cluster. So, I mean, you get to stuff where you, it's unbeatable in throughput, but, but that. In terms of benchmarking themselves that companies are doing, is any of that stuff available publicly? Yeah, so these ones are, I, if you send me an email or something, I can send you the links. I, I don't have them here on me, but I can send you some links of some benchmarks, yes. Yeah, 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 I, I hear you, yeah. But I mean, the, the problem is that it depends so heavily on the types of queries you use, right? I mean, simple queries, will, this, this is really excels. And then when you start going to more complex stuff, then you start running issues with latency of messaging, waiting for, waiting for some node. I mean, the problem is. Uh, you know, if you look at the difference between, say, most web applications. Yeah. Using yeah, that's, this, is, does, this is not good for us. Yeah, yeah, definitely. I mean, in theory, if you, th if you think about using a, uh, if you think about using a key value, some kind of key value store, this this is will be better because it will be it will give you the same performance with the high availability, and you get the SQL acid stuff, which you don't always get with the key value stores. Well, it's durable. Yeah, 
Well, I mean, it's just MySQL queries. So it's, it's you, I mean, if you send MySQL, that's, that's the beauty of it. It's just MySQL queries, but behind the, behind the scenes, it's, the, it's this thing. The problem is that it's not the easiest to administer and, and control. I mean, it's a bit more complicated than, than setting up something yeah, simple. But I'm assuming, you know, from the standpoint of having a command, a cluster should be anyway. Yeah, yeah. Mm. Yeah, I mean, I mean, we have customers who use this for storing just session data and, and things that, stuff like simple, really simple things, but, but, but they just have so many, uh, 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 they just have so many simultaneous sessions that they need something that scales and, and they use it to store session data, uh, like the cluster. I'm sorry, gentlemen, we're going to have to get the next class in here, yeah. so uh, we'll have to cut this off. Yeah, well, I'm available for questions at any time. So. Thank you. Cloud stacks are everywhere. This is the way to, to better utilize uh, all your resources and it makes managing all your resources pretty easy. All of the innovation is happening in open source. The, the collaborative nature and of the, uh, you know, of the community and, and the speed at which these, uh, these, you know, these, these deficiencies, these bugs are getting discovered and, and fixed is a uh, thing that really shows the power of the, you know, of the open source community. It is global and it's definitely because of the users. Community people are extremely friendly and uh, always ready to help. If you go on to IRC any day, you'll see these guys helping each other out and they're all doing it like in a selfless manner. The product is transparent for everyone. Everyone can look at the code base. Um, Everyone can see how CloudStack is, is being built. Nothing, nothing is proprietary. Everything is open. In many ways, it's absolutely vital to the, to the ongoing health of CloudStack. The most exciting event uh, in recent memory for me uh, was our first developer boot camp. Uh, and you know, our call gave people, I think, maybe two weeks notice to come attend. I was expecting 25 or, or 30 people. Uh, so we ended up with uh, 87 <laughs> people uh, and had to go get more chairs uh, into the room twice. Everything within cloud computing is commodity and is open source. And so I, I don't think that you will, uh, you, you'll see anywhere where open source is not pervasive in cloud computing. And so I, I, think, it's, uh, I think it's an assumption. I think. When you talk about cloud computing, you're really talking about open source cloud computing. CloudStack is a robust solution for large deployments. You have dozens of data centers and thousands of servers in each data center. Uh, these um, uh, hardware is going to fail and CloudStack is designed to handle, number one, that mass scale. Number two, it's designed to handle the failure that inevitably happens. Uh, in large deployments. We started working on CloudStack over four years ago uh, and you know it was the original set of people working on it uh, had a background of delivering software to telcos and service providers. Lots of QA, lots of users actually using it. High availability is the key feature. Uh, multiple hypervisor support. Uh, different network models, you can pick up whatever suits you better. CloudStack management server can be deployed in different physical machines. It definitely has a huge footprint, it's being deployed everywhere. There's a major movie studio that uh, um, they were using CloudStack, they were using it to transcode video, and I thought that was terribly fascinating. What I found more fascinating is what they did during lunch where they would spin up uh, you know, 50 or 60 game servers, then as soon as lunch was over, they would destroy all the instances and go back to doing real work. CloudStack is vast. Uh, it touches so many different aspects, and there's no one person that's kind of like a master of all those realms. I think CloudStack as a project is going to be uh, one of the leaders simply because it's some of the most featureful and, and uh, and robust platforms out there. I don't see any limits to the cloud stack.
When we created Asterisk over a decade ago, we could not have imagined that Asterisk would not only become the most widely adopted open source communication software on the planet, but that it would impact the entire industry in the way that it has. Today, Asterisk has found its way into more than 170 countries and virtually every Fortune 1000 company. The success of Asterisk has enabled a transition of power from the hands of the traditional proprietary phone vendors into the hands of the users and administrators of phone systems. Using this power, our customers have created all sorts of business-changing applications, from small office phone systems to mission-critical call centers to international carrier networks. In fact, there's even an entire country whose communications infrastructure runs on Astros. Digium has always been about creating technology that expands communications capabilities in ways that we could never have imagined. And that's part of what's game-changing about Digium. Today, we're doing it again, this time by introducing a new family of HDIP phones that extends control of the user all the way to the desktop. The launch of these new products represents the next phase in Digium's history of innovation. These are the first and only IP phones designed to fully leverage the power of Asterisk. When we first discussed our expectations for building a family of phones for use with Asterisk, our requirements were pretty simple. We asked the team to build the phones such that they were easy to install, integrate, provision, and use. I think you'll soon agree our engineers have delivered on that goal. User feedback is validating that when it comes to operation with Astra Space Systems, including our own SwitchFox based product, these are the easiest to use, best integrated, most interoperable products on the market today. The Digium family of phones will initially include three IP desk phones, uniquely designed to complement any Astra or SwitchFox based solution. These phones are different for a number of reasons. First, they're exclusively designed for use with Astra. Secondly, we've made it really easy to auto-discover and provision the phones. Next, we've made it easy for the phones to access information inside of Asterisk, allowing tight coupling between an application and the phone. Additionally, we've created an applications engine that allows users and developers to create and run their own apps on the phone. And finally, we've done all of this at a very compelling price point. At Digium, we're always thinking of ways to give our customers the best value in business phone systems and also give them the power to create their own solutions for any communications challenge. We'll continue to push the boundaries, not only to make Asterisk cooler and faster and more technologically feature rich, but to make Asterisk and VoIP communications even easier. And together, we'll change the way the world communicates. Again.